Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. So Chuck just read for us the, the birth narrative from the Gospel of Luke. But what did it cost? What did it cost Jesus to be born? That's where I'd like to start. Every year during the Christmas season, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the Son of Mary, the Son of God. We celebrate His birth as the beginning of the mission of Jesus as a human with the purpose of living a life like all of us live, yet without sin, only to end up on a Roman cross for the sins he didn't commit. This morning, I'd like for us to consider what it meant for Jesus to be born a baby. You've heard me use the phrase often, a dirty diapered baby. I, I, I use that phrase on purpose because I want you to think about the indignity of the creator sustainer of the universe having a dirty diaper. I mean, little Harper, she's not that big, but I'm telling you what, the whole house can tell when she's got a dirty diaper. The aroma is just unbelievable. The indignity of the Savior, of the, the Creator, Sustainer of the universe, being confined to the womb for nine months, being laid in a manger, and having to deal with dirty diapers and skin knees, and so forth. So this morning I'd like for us to consider what it meant for Jesus to be born a baby. I'd like for us to explore the sacrifice Jesus made on our behalf. Jesus didn't begin at Christmas. Jesus didn't begin at conception. We understand the truth that life begins at conception. But Jesus was already alive before that. At Christmas, we sing about the babe in the manger. We talk about the birth of Jesus. But that's not where this starts. Turn over in your Bibles or your tablets or your phones to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not count it equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death on a cross." Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let's see what we can dig out of this passage. I, I love this passage and I think it's the perfect Christmas passage. The Apostle Paul describes Jesus this way. In verse 6 he says, He's God. The dirty diapered baby in the manger that the shepherds visited is God. He's not some form. He's not something. He is God. As Paul's writing this, he's encouraging the people in Philippi to have the same mind as Jesus, to think the same way as Jesus, to follow Him, and think in the same direction that He goes. Paul then begins to explain who Jesus really is. He was in the form of God. That is a kind of a confusing statement to us. In the form of God. The word form is... What causes this statement to be a little confusing? We we'll often think that form carries the idea of looks like, but is not the same as. The Greek word which is translated as form is morphe, from where we get 
morph. You know, things morph from one to the other. But the original meaning of morphe, the Greek root word, is the same root or same nature and same character. So when, when Paul says that Jesus is in the form of God, he's saying he's the morphe of God, the same nature and same character as God. In other words, he is God. Jesus, the babe in the manger, is God. He was equal to God. The Apostle Paul says he, he didn't need to, to attain to that. He didn't need to strive to become equal with God because he was equal with God. As God already, Jesus didn't have to become God or fight to become equal with God. You have to remember that many, many of the people that are reading this letter were polytheists. And they were polytheists in a system of, of mortals being elevated to gods. Jesus was not a mortal elevated to God. He always was God. He was the creator, sustainer of the universe, God. And so he didn't have to fight to become God. The Apostle Paul also tells us in verse 7 that he emptied himself. In points 1 and 2, Paul established that Jesus was God in every way equal to God. Then Paul says that Jesus emptied himself. As God, Jesus possesses all the attributes of God. And there are a bunch. But just to remind you of a few. Omniscience. Omnipotence. Omnipresence. Self-existent. I love that one. Self-existent. He doesn't depend on anything or anyone else. Little Harper there depends on, on others. And she depends on oxygen. And she depends on her mom and her dad and her grandma and her grandpa to care for her. She depends on her doctor to give her the right meds. All of that. Jesus is self-existent. He depends on no one and nothing. He's infinite. He's sovereign. He's constant and consistent, which is also called immutable. He's holy. He's just. He's righteous. He's faithful. And I can go on and on and on. These are attributes of God. And Jesus chose to set some of those attributes aside. So that he could experience life as a human. From conception to death. Did Jesus ever stop being God? Absolutely not. Did Jesus ever stop being omniscient? Absolutely not. Did Jesus ever stop being holy? No. Or sovereign or just? No. He simply chose not to exercise those attributes. In theological circles, this is called the doctrine of kenosis. From the word that Paul uses in Philippians there to set aside. It's kenosis. Set aside to no longer avail yourself of them. Paul tells us in Colossians chapter 1 that Jesus is the creator, sustainer of the universe. He created and maintains the box we call time and space. And yet he stood outside of that box. He stood outside of the box of time and space as the creator of it. And then at just the right time, he willingly stepped into the box. He willingly became the most fragile, feeble, incapable participants in the box. For nine months, he resided in the womb of Mary. All the while maintaining the world. Those nine months as he grew in utero, he didn't get to exercise his omnipotence or his justice. He didn't stop being God. He just didn't exercise those attributes. There's also a sense that kenosis speaks about the position 
and not just the attributes of God. He is God, sovereign of the universe, and He willingly stepped out of that position into the universe. So Kenosis not only talks about the, the availability or the use of the attributes, but also of the very position itself. And he willingly became a slave. He grew within Mary as a full human being. He took on the form, same word, morph, meaning nature and character of a slave. I wish our English translations would actually use the word slave and not bondservant. He was a slave just like we are. Not a slave to sin because he knew no sin. So in what ways is man a slave other than as a slave to, sinner, to sin? When we consider the hierarchy of beings, we are subservient to God and to angels. Jesus was made a little lower than the angels. In the hierarchy, it's God, angels, man. And Jesus stepped down from that lofty position as God and into that form, that nature of being a man. But there's also a reality that as humans, we are confined to breathe air. I mean, as kids, when we get mad, we do what? How long does that last? 30 seconds. You get really mad, maybe a minute, but then your face turns red and you suck air because that's what you got to do. We're slaves to it. We can't. Kate and I have been under the ocean. And if your bottle runs dry, what happens? You got no air. You got to get to the top. You're a slave to air. We're a slave to food and to water. You've got to have them. If you don't have them, you die. We're a slave to sleep. Got to have it. Trust me, I know this. Because I don't get it much. We are slaves to those things. We have to have them. We have to do them. Jesus now couldn't get away from those things either. He was a slave to them as well. For nine months, He was confined to the womb. I wonder what the thought process was for the creator sustainer of the universe as the egg was fertilized and then began dividing. When he's four cells, what was his what was he thinking? Eight cells, sixteen cells, thirty two what's he thinking as this process is happening? He was confined to the end of the umbilical cord from Mary. Then he relied on Mary to nurse him, to clean his bottom, to feed him, to comfort him, to give him rest. Jesus existed eternally, not needing anything, but now he needed Mary. He needed to eat. He needed to sleep. He needed someone to come and wipe his butt. He was a slave. Born a human. What did Jesus do as a human? He lived in every way that we did do. Being born a human made him a slave to all the things we just talked about. What was it like growing up in the carpenter shop? How many times did the hammer hit the wrong nail? How many times did his brothers and sisters, who by all accounts hated him, pick on him? Trip him going down the stairs. All the things that brothers and sisters do. He was born a human and he went through human emotions. He went through human struggles. Shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. A true emotional picture of the pain that he suffered in his life. Paul also tells us in this passage he submitted to, to death. Existed eternally, 
before there was time and space. And then he got in the box and then he submitted to let the box kill him. His conception and birth were for the express purpose of going to the cross to die. He for eternity stood outside of time and space, outside of death. Now here he was born to die. But not just to die a physical death on the cross, <coughs> but to fracture the harmony and continuity of the triune Godhead. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me in agony and pain? Both physical and spiritual. Jesus hung on that cross, now rejected by the Father, as He became sin for us. I submit that as He cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, the, the, the relationship between the Father and the Son was fractured. Eternity past, they had been in perfect harmony. And now that relationship was fractured. Jesus hung on the cross, rejected by the Father, as He became sin for us. When Jesus submitted to death, He did so in a physical and in a spiritual sense. All to pay the price for your sins and for my sins. But the story doesn't end there. He was exalted by God. He was placed in the borrowed grave Friday afternoon. Remained there through Friday night, all day Saturday, Saturday night. Then Sunday morning, He was made alive again. And He came out of the grave. Spent some time with the disciples. And then 40 days later, was ascended back into heaven where He, exalted, he was exalted on the right hand of the Father. The position of authority where He remains today ultimately every knee will bow in verse 10 when jesus sits on the throne of david and rules the world from jerusalem ultimately jesus will be seen by all as sovereign he will be seen as all by all as god present with them he will rule the universe so this Christmas, I'd like for you to consider what it means that Jesus, who was always God, who eternally existed without the need of anything or anyone else, as a member of the triune Godhead, who is the creator, sustainer of the universe, standing outside of the universe of time and space, and decided to become part of time and space. I believe that when Jesus climbed into the box of time and space, he could never climb out. He sacrificed something that we don't think about. Once he got in the box, he's now eternally in the box. He's still God. He's still sovereign. He's still omniscient. But he's now confined to the box. He received a body that grew within the womb of Mary. He took the body to the cross where it was killed by the force of sin. But that same body came out of the borrowed grave, a glorified body. The same body, but greatly improved. He still has this body. And having a body restricts him to being in the box. The body is part of the box. I've thought and considered and pondered and studied on this subject for quite a while. I don't believe Jesus can ever be rid of the body. Just like we will never be rid of the body that we receive at the rapture. I've concluded that He can't get rid of the body. Which means that He'll always be part of the box. This Christmas I ask for you to consider the sacrifice made by Jesus. We all, have a relation, we all have relationships that have been damaged through the actions of one party or another. Even long-term relationships. 
But none of us have ever been in an eternal relationship that was fractured, that was scarred, or even broken. The Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sakes He was made to be sin who know no sin, knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. His action on the cross was for you. So that you could know God. Because when Adam sinned, we were all plunged into the, into the depths of sins and we were all enemies with God. But Jesus provided a way for us to be no longer an enemy. As Jesus hung on the cross and the weight of all the sin of the world fell on Jesus and He became the symbol of all that sin. And as Jesus hung on the cross, God saw your sin and my sin on that cross. Matthew records in Matthew 27, and about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A relationship of the triune Godhead that existed eternally, now fractured as Jesus was left alone in pain, physical and spiritual, on the cross. His relationship with the Father was at best strained, if not actually broken. Jesus died on the cross and remained in the grave with at best a strained relationship with the triune God. Then on Sunday morning, Jesus comes out of the grave. Look what happens in John chapter 20. <coughs> but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stopped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid, them, laid Him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing. But she didn't know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried uh, him away, tell me where you've laid him and I'll take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father and to my God and your God. So there we have the Sunday morning experience of Mary Magdalene, a fascinating scene. Jesus is raised from the dead and Mary Magdalene comes to the tomb and finds it open. And she even talks with Him, not realizing that it's Him. She talks with the angels and all she wants is the body so they can properly bury it. When she realizes that it's Jesus, she grabs Him and hugs, and hugs Him. I suspect this was the biggest bear hug of her life. But Jesus' response is just a little odd. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to Me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to My brothers and say to them, I am ascending to My Father and to your Father and to My God and your God. Don't cling to me. I haven't been yet to my father. But tell the boys I'm going to the father. Tell the boys I'm going to them and then I'll see them. Later that evening, Jesus meets with the rest of the disciples. I think the first order of business for Jesus that Sunday morning was to go back to heaven. Repair the relationship that was fractured on Friday afternoon. Repair the relationship with the Father and reunite and make the triune Godhead whole again. Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night, Sunday morning, the relationship with the Father was at best fractured. And I believe more than that. Jesus felt the impact of sin and it strained an eternal relationship. He then physically lay in the grave over the weekend. He spiritually descended into Abraham's bosom where the Apostle Paul later tells us that he led captive free 
I believe what Paul is telling us is that he took the Old Testament saints and prepared them to go to heaven with him after the resurrection when he ascended to re-initiate his communion with the Father. The sacrifice Jesus made when he was born was to live in the box. To know that his relationship with the Father was going to be strained if not broken. And he'd have to fix it. This Christmas I would ask for you to consider Jesus is the only God who ever gave up his life for the life of his people. Every other religious system involves in some way people giving up their lives for God. But Christmas is all about God beginning the process to give up his life for us. I love this cross, this Christmas tree cross. You see, the cross means nothing without Christmas. If it's not God born, then the cross means nothing. And Christmas means nothing without the cross. Without God being born to die. Without Jesus dying on the cross. The birth of Jesus means absolutely nothing. It's just another kid in, in uh, Bethlehem being born. It means nothing. Without the cross, Christmas has no meaning. So what Jesus? So what if Jesus was born? If He wasn't born to die, there's no effect. If He did not go to the cross, there would be no value in the birth of Jesus. Jesus in the manger only means something when we see Jesus on the cross. And Jesus on the cross only means something because we see Jesus in the manger born of a virgin. If Jesus was not born a human, the cross would have been ineffectual. If Jesus were not on the cross, if Jesus were not God, the cross would have been ineffectual. The cross requires the manger and the manger requires the cross. This Christmas I'd like for you to consider gifts given to us by God. We naturally think of the gifts underneath the tree and when we get together for our Christmas party, we're all focused eventually of getting to those gifts. And who can get the biggest, best gift? But think about the gifts that God gives through Christmas. First and foremost, He gave us the gift of eternal life. As we've already said, the cross is part of Christmas. When Adam sinned and plunged the entire universe into a sinful state of decay, God already had a plan. God didn't react to Adam's sin. He planned it out before he sinned. And that plan included Jesus being born of a virgin, fully God, fully man, so that he could go to the cross and pay our penalty for sin. On Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus, born to die to save us. <coughs> On Christmas, God also gave the world a gift of a high priest, who can empathize with us because he lived a life like we do. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. He got overwhelmed with emotion. In every way, he went through life just like we do, yet without sin. But then on the cross, the weight of sin was placed on him, so he knows the weight of sin as well. We can have confidence in him because he's been there and done that. On Christmas, God gave the world a present through the impact of the followers of Jesus that they would have on the world. The church has brought to the world some wonderful blessings. The majority of the hospitals, at least in the West, have been started by the church. The majority of schools have been started by the church. The church, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, has worked to restrain sin. We haven't done a real good job of that in the last few years, but it's a role the church has played for now 2,000 years. On Christmas, God gave the world another promise that He kept from way back in Genesis chapter 3. God promised a Savior. On Christmas, that gift was received. On Christmas, God gave the world the gift of Himself. Every other religious tradition, you have to die for God. But Jesus, a little baby, growing to experience the world so that He could go to the cross and make it legal for God to save you. On Christmas, God gave to the world 
hope. For the Jews in Israel, things were looking darker and darker. It would not be too many years until the temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was destroyed and the people were all seen in past tense. But on Christmas, a little boy was born who would provide both to the Jews and the Gentile a hope for the future. On Christmas, God provided the world with the gift of peace. Because of the sin of Adam, the world was at war with God. The little baby born on Christmas means that there was now a way to achieve peace with God. On Christmas, God gave to the world joy. Joy because through the little boy born, peace could come, a relationship gained, and joy of God could again flow in our veins and exist in the hearts of men. What was the cost to Jesus for being the original Christmas gift? It cost Jesus His life. It cost Jesus His relationship with the Father, even if only temporary. An eternal relationship fractured. It cost Jesus the use of some of His divine attributes. It cost Jesus everything to love us and to step into the box of the universe. This Christmas, think about who Jesus was and who He is and the sacrifice He made to save you from your sins. This Christmas, think about the gifts that God gives to the world through Jesus. This Christmas, think about the mission Jesus has called us to. Father, thank You. Thank You for the reality of who You are and what You have done. Thank You for the reality of the birth of Jesus, our Savior. The fact that He was born in a manger Born of a virgin, fully man, yet fully God. Born to die. Born to bear the weight of the sin of the world. So that you could legally save us. Thank you, Father. We love you and we're so excited about the gift you've given to us in Jesus through Christmas. We love you and we always want to make you proud and we always want to worship you and serve you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church located at 10251 Metro Parkway Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.